Welcome back, brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible study. Last week, we completed the first scroll of Peter, or of the rock, the stone, that chief amongst the pillars, amongst the apostles. Today, in the Western Rite, people have been celebrating the great holiday of St. Peter's and Paul. I believe we have one or two more weeks left before we celebrate it in the Gezrite, in the Alexandrian and the Antiochian, or the Coptic and the Syriac traditions. So we are in 2 Peter chapter 1. There are three chapters in total of this scroll, and we'll begin with verses 1 to 2. Today, I'm going to be a little out there and read from the NRSV just to switch things up. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith as precious as ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be yours in abundance in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. Here we have the second scroll of Peter, beginning with the idea that he is a servant and that he is an apostle, one who is sent forth from Jesus Christ. And we have these great liturgical elements that have been featured in all the rites, in the Roman rite, the Greek rite, and all the Afro-Asiatic rites. The idea when the priest says that he wishes the grace and the peace of the Lord be with the congregants or with the congregation, with the gathering. As I grant you all the same grace and peace that priests everywhere have been granting as they have been chosen by bishops who were put in power by apostles. I want to remind you to wherever you are, partake and share in this grace, share in this piece of his word by subscribing on YouTube or on Spotify or on Apple, wherever it is that you find this and sharing it with other people. Just like the grace and the peace are freely shared with you, you may freely share it with others. And if you find it in your charity, you can go to patreon.com slash and donate. Verses 3 to 4. His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Thus he has given us through these things his precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. Very important here. The Bible is always against lust, but sometimes we have to think bigger. Sometimes we got to look beyond the individual and look at the community. Sometimes as rugged Americans who believe in rugged American individualism, we focus too much on the individual and we forget about the community. We forget about the body of Christ. So if you think back to Hosea 1, and if you think back to Ezekiel 16, you will recognize that the Lord is not pleased with the lust of the body of Christ, with the lust of the community, the church of Israel. And so Israel is always compared to a whore, to a harlot, to a prostitute, one who is cheating on her bridegroom, God, the living God, the author of life. And so we have to make sure that we are faithful in all that we do. These verses here have to do with being faithful, right? He is calling us to be faithful. We are not calling him to be faithful. He's calling us. He's reaching out to us. The primary way in which he reaches out to us is by having people attend to the public reading or recitation of scripture and then nagging us and nagging us in myriad ways till we get the picture, whether it's a, an individual revelation or a series of witnesses who keep bringing us the same message. I know that's how I was dragged into the diaconate and really compelled. And so you can be too. 
verses 5 to 15 expand on this seemingly mystical idea of divine nature that I think a lot of people get carried away with with some of their larger Greek terms that they like to use. Um, they want to become God. Father Paul Nadim Tarazi reminds us to not try to become God, but just to try to become a normal human being as it was meant to be in the Edenic paradise. So let's do verses 5 to 15. For this very reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with endurance and endurance with godliness and godliness with mutual affection and mutual affection with love. For if these things are yours and are increasing among you, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For anyone who lacks these things is short-sighted and blind and is forgetful of the cleansing of past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more eager to confirm your call and election. For if you do this, you will never stumble. For in this way, entry into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be richly provided for you. Therefore, I intend to keep on reminding you of these things, though you know them already and are established in the truth that has come to you. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to refresh your memory, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Some of you may be fretting about the election in the United States right now. Here, the text is talking about a whole different type of election, a whole different type of choice or selection, a choice that, that does not come from the majority opinion of the people, but from the tyrannical and thus majestic will of God. So the divine nature is explained here, and we have several puns. All this device, all this fleshing out of the divine nature is presented by the Apostle Peter as something he is giving as a reminder while he's in this body. In this body meaning his physical body, one, but also the second meaning meaning in the body of Christ before he departs the church militant to get to the church triumphant, before he leaves earth to go to heaven. So, as I said, people get carried away with the divine nature. Instead of nature, you can say proclivity, you can say tendency, you can say character. What we need to understand is that it's, divine, it's defined in this text. So, it's very practical. The divine nature here is the same thing as love in defined as the fruits of the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. So, here we have love at the end. And it's explanatory of everything else that comes before it. In Galatians 5, you have love at the beginning. And it, it has the explanatory power of all the fruits of the Holy Spirit that are list, listed after it. So here we have goodness. We have knowledge. We have self-control. We have endurance. We have godliness. We have mutual affection. And all of these are love. You love your invisible God by being good to your visible neighbors, strangers, and enemies. You love God by sharing the knowledge that he gives you with all of your neighbors, strangers, and enemies. You love God by having self-control and restraint and endurance in this self-control and godliness or keeping yourself pure and mutual affection, which is itself another way of saying love with all of your neighbors, strangers, and enemies. In this way, you become a fruitful tree of Jesus. If he's walking down a path, an orchard of several of his trees, some of them are barren and some of them are bearing fruit. May he make us that fruit which is well-pleasing to him. That is what we sing as we 
are delivering the communion, his flesh and blood, uh, visible in the bread and wine. We come down, the clergy, and as we are giving his flesh and blood to the communicants, we sing this hymn, and the communicants sing along with us. Give it to me, grant it to me, grant me the privilege to be a tree that bears fruit that pleases you. The Lord is not interested in tangerines. The Lord is not interested in apples, nor is he interested in pomegranates. He's interested in love expressed through goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, and mutual affection. And he sent forth the apostle Peter, the rock, not to be with us forever, but he gave him a word so that when the rock would depart, his word would remain. And in that word, we have a written life-giving message that is a refresher of our salvation until the Lord comes again, which we'll get into in these final verses. 16 to the end. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty for he, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoken from God. There you have it. The scripture is the canon, the scripture is put together. The scripture is a series of literature with one message that the church has been interpreting for a long, long time. So we need to eat that scripture and find its life-giving message, which is not found in pagan or secular, secular rhetoric. It's not based off the brilliance of the apostles. In the Acts of the Apostles, it says they were unschooled and untrained. They were ordinary men that were given an extraordinary revelation of righteousness directly of Jesus. In the Israelite tradition, we say this happened at Mount Tabor, Tabor. The transfiguration, it is called, according to the Greek rite. It is one of nine great holidays in the Israelite. And... It is when he was whiter than anything that they had ever seen, purely majestic, to use the words here. And here in, this, in these uh, verses, there's a line that I use. Jesus, in uh, the transfiguration, is defined by the voice of God as Davidian or Davidic and Enochian. David means beloved. Enoch Although he means the one who is dedicated, his story, at least the, the son of Jared, not the son of Cain. The son of Cain is a, is a bad Enoch, but the good Enoch, who is the son of Jared, ends up being well-pleasing to God. And so he, he translates him. It's this funny word in the Bible. He translates him. He takes him away so that nobody could see him. So here, by being well-pleasing, our Lord Jesus is Enochian. By being beloved, he is Davidic. So he represents the character of the biblical David and the biblical Enoch. He represents the Ketuvim, which are the writings, the wisdom literature of the Older Testament or the Hebrew Bible, as well as the Torah, the instruction, the law, the Pentateuch, those first five books as well. So whether you're a Sadducee or a Pharisee or a Gentile, 
you are ready to accept Jesus for fulfillment of that which you hold as scripture. And he is bringing you a word which will be a lamp unto your feet, as it says in the Psalms, in a dark place till the day dawns or till judgment comes and the morning star who is the judge rises in your hearts which is your thoughts they believed that the celestial bodies were deities and so the god man jesus christ the morning star the judge will come again to judge the living and the dead may he make us unashamed upon his second coming